This is CBC Nova Scotia News. Tonight, out of order, a family raises safety concerns for these Nova Scotia seniors who lost their landline for nearly two months. System overflow. Halifax reveals how much wastewater went into the harbor in 2023. And curtain call. How the end of some federal funding will impact performing artists. Wet and windy tonight. Then temperatures dropping rapidly throughout Thursday as things freeze up. Your full forecast is coming up. Good evening. The family of an elderly couple in Nova Scotia's Annapolis Valley is calling a two-month landline outage a safety concern. It happened between November and January. In addition to not receiving important calls, the couple was also not able to make calls in the event of an emergency. As Angela McIver reports, the case speaks to a wider issue affecting people in rural areas. When Jim Sackaman's landline stopped working last November, he lost a lifeline. I actually couldn't remember my own number, and I uh, reacted in crisis. The outage lasted seven weeks. The 76-year-old and his partner struggle with memory issues, and his loved ones say a cell phone is not an option. There's a true disability there uh, in terms of his ability to learn that new skill at this point in his life with his medical conditions. CBC News took their concerns to the CRTC. It says it's concerned about this situation and encouraged the family to file a complaint, writing, the CRTC ensures that major telephone companies like Bell make basic voice telephone services available to their customers and these companies are required to maintain their networks. Effectively, these folks have had a disconnection. This advocate calls the case egregious and says he isn't surprised to hear Sackman's landline is still connected by old copper wire, which makes repairs more difficult. As Bell works to replace that network with fiber op across the country, he says many rural customers are left on the edge. That's just too low a quality of service, I think. Um, and the CRTC could be doing more during this transition to ask or tell the companies to keep up their level of of service on the copper until it's replaced. Sackerman's family believes landlines should be a priority for phone companies, calling them a right. They're paying for it, you know, and, and that's what they need in this house. They should have a consistent service provided to them. In a statement, Bell said the goal is to get customers back in service as quickly and safely as possible by prioritizing repairs with the largest customer impact, like cell tower repairs. Bell said once those are done, crews restore service to smaller groups of customers and individuals. The company did not say why it took two months to repair Sackman's landline, but it did credit his account. Angela McIver, CBC News. Halifax. Construction will begin this spring on the new Halifax Infirmary Acute Care Tower as part of the QE2 redevelopment project. This is what the new facility will look like. The province says it will be a modern health care building that will include 216 acute care beds, 16 operating rooms, an intensive care unit and a new larger emergency department. The new facility will be built close to Roby Street in an area where a parkade currently sits. That parkade is expected to be demolished this summer. Working more and more with the clinicians now to make sure that this um, historical build really is, you know, meets their needs. It's future-proofed and also um, meets the needs of patients. Last May, the Nova Scotia government announced it would be spending $245 million to prepare the site for the first phase of construction. A final cost and completion date are yet to be determined. Nova Scotians with diabetes will now have access to government funding for glucose monitoring and greater access to the province's insulin pump program. The provincial government is investing $7.2 million in Thursday's budget on diabetes care, including $5.9 million for sensor-based glucose monitoring supplies. Glucose supplies will be funded through a new income-based program and existing pharmacare programs. Households with annual incomes of less than $60,000 will not have to pay a deductible. The funding options will be open to people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Advocates are celebrating the announcement.
I live with type 1 myself, and I am lucky to be able to use devices such as insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitors, but I know a lot of people cannot afford that due to financial restrictions. And many, I work with pediatric patients, people living with type 1, people living with type 2, and I'm thinking of all the people that I work with that didn't have access to these things and now will. And like, I, it makes me feel emotional now, honestly. The province is also expanding the insulin pump program by removing the age cap, which had been set at 26 years and under. About 4,000 patients will be helped to cover their supplies with the change and another 450 patients will be made eligible through the insulin pump program. Nova Scotia's Minister of Environment and Climate Change is taking exception to criticism that his government's abandoning of the Coastal Protection Act will lead to more risky coastal development. Critics say without the act, development will run amok. But Tim Hallman argues rather than using a single piece of legislation, his government will use multiple tools to help inform property owners and municipalities to make sound development decisions. What we have now is a comprehensive uh, approach uh, that will empower uh, local decision making at the municipal level that will support um, um, informed decision making by residents and deploy immediately uh, resources to help with coastal protection uh, such as enhanced flood line mapping, um, coastal erosion surveys which we'll be doing in a very tangible way uh, the Department of Public Works uh, under our plan will be putting up signage uh, in areas that we know are, are known hazards to inform Nova Scotians. I'll talk to Tim Hallman about his government's decision to scrap the Coastal Protection Act and its approach to protecting our coastlines. That's our Newsmaker interview just after 6.30. The town of Trenton was recently fined six figures for violating the Fisheries Act after raw, untreated sewage was discharged because of a blocked pipe. The CBC's Preston Mulligan examines the decision and asks how different this situation is from how water is treated in other municipalities. In 2017, someone was walking along Loudon Brook in Trenton when they smelled something unpleasant in the water. Environment and Climate Change Canada got wind of it too, and they sent instructions to clean it up. But for two years, nothing happened. There was a blockage in a pipe that was supposed to carry that wastewater to a nearby treatment facility. Now, the initial warnings from the federal government to clean it up fell on deaf ears. It was, though, eventually all cleared up by 2020. This month, the town of Trenton was fined $100,000 and is now listed on the Environmental Offenders Registry. Trenton's new CAO says what they're trying to do now is earn back the community's trust. The town is making strides to ensure that it doesn't happen again, and the town took full ownership and pled guilty, right, did not go to a trial. Now, the volume of raw wastewater that ended up in Loudonsbrook was never really measured. The CAO told me that two years is a long time, and if you're told to clean it up and you don't, it's not surprising that the town was hit with such a substantial fine. But when it comes to releasing wastewater into the environment, sometimes it's cases like Trenton, other times it's by design. Let's look at CBRM. There's a treatment plant there, but the municipality's website admits that raw sewage is, quote, sometimes discharged directly into the environment without treatment. And then there's HRM. If running within capacity, wastewater mixed with stormwater is sent to the treatment facility where it's screened twice and disinfected with ultraviolet light. Sometimes, though, like during last year's heavy rains, it overflows. In 2023, Halifax sent 4.6 billion liters of CSO, that's wastewater and stormwater combined, into Halifax Harbor. So that's about 1,840 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Or to put it another way, 11% of all the wastewater generated in Halifax ended up in the harbor last year. It was screened, but it wasn't treated. Bottom line is when it comes to treatment plants, no matter who builds them or who operates them, they are designed to overflow. And every municipality in the province is struggling to build infrastructure to keep up with more intense storms and a growing population. Preston Mulligan, CBC News, Halifax. Clearing up all of the snow from this month's massive storm in Cape Breton has come with a hefty price tag. So far, it's cost the Cape Breton Regional Municipality around $3 million, and that's not even the final cost. That's still being tallied. 
Mayor Amanda McDougall says the cost has already surpassed the municipality's annual snow clearing budget. In some places, more than 150 centimeters of snow fell. Then, a week later, another 30 more centimeters came down. The municipality had to hire additional snow clearing contractors to help with snow removal. The CBRM has reached out to the province and the federal government to help pay for the cleanup. What a February it has been for Indeed. weather in this province. Let's check in with Ryan now for the latest on the forecast. And now instead of snow, it's rain out there today. Yeah, why not go out with one big final bang? I mean, it has been quite a month, as we just said, and uh, we can see that uh, this is going to be a very wet and windy end to the month. Uh, you can see temperatures, or sorry, rainfall outlook is at 30 to 50 millimeters. Not much change in this forecast. The further southwest you are, the greater chance you have of cracking that 50 millimeter total. And it does look like Yarmouth and Shelburne and Digby counties are the best chances for that. Amounts will drop off as we work our way towards the east, anywhere from 15 to as much as 30 millimeters, looking more likely for eastern areas of the province. Now that rain is already streaming in from west to east, starting to work its way back into the Halifax area. And there's more to come with these rounds of rain that are going to work their way in ahead of this cold front. And then, of course, on the other side of the front, a dramatic temperature drop and a very rapid freeze setting up for tomorrow, especially uh, across uh, most of the region throughout the morning, but even into the early afternoon for the east. Let's look at the winds. Widespread gusts 70, 80, 90 kilometers per hour. And yes, some gusts likely in the 100 kilometer per hour range for coastal and exposed areas. So this is certainly going to be bring the risk of some power outages as we move throughout the overnight tonight and into early Thursday. The southerly winds will then shift to west and northwest winds, which will be a little bit lighter and won't be as impactful, but will certainly be ushering in that cooler air. There's Cape Breton, kind of the last to see those strongest winds by about lunchtime tomorrow, but then those winds still breezy, as we said, from the west to northwest. The warm air tonight continues, fog patches, the rain at times heavy, and then here comes our cold front. Note 8 a.m. tomorrow morning already dropping to the freezing mark in through the uh, west of the province, still into the double digits in the east. Looks like Halifax, kind of a late morning towards the lunchtime hours when we'll see those temperatures dramatically falling. Any standing water is going to pretty quickly freeze up as we drop up around 8 10, 12 degrees in only three, four or five hours. So things are not going to have a chance to run off and get away. They're going to freeze up pretty quickly here. And so by Thursday, as we all hit the roads to head home, be mindful that things are going to be icy. Any uh, standing water is going to be definitely freezing up. Sidewalks, walkways, untreated surfaces. Make sure you are taking extra caution tomorrow afternoon, Tom and Amy. The cold air does not last all that long, though, we'll explain <laughs> in your seven-day forecast. <laughs> Warm-up right. right around the corner. Yes. Okay, thanks so much, Thank Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Well, federal officials are defending the decision to keep the majority share of redfish quota in the Gulf of St. Lawrence in the hands of companies with large vessels. The Department of Fisheries and Oceans is set to reopen the fishery in June after a 30-year moratorium. As Paul Withers reports, some MPs are not happy with the offshore fleet, which is largely here in Nova Scotia. The redfish quota is like a game of musical chairs. That fishery closed in big part because of this big vessel. We had those who were not invested in the coastal communities, who were not invested in the sustainability. MPs on a parliamentary committee unhappy the big boats will keep 58% of the quota when the Gulf Red Fishery reopens. It did not matter the minister reduced the fleet's historical share by 20% and gave it to other fishing communities. This quantity of quota being allocated to the offshore fisheries, how that benefits local fishers, local communities, and, and those who are um, seeing this resource and, and marine ecosystem right on their front doorsteps uh, being uh, utilized for offshore uh, corporate interests. Lisa Barron dismissed the impact of those offshore companies in coastal communities at plants like this one, processing redfish caught outside the Gulf. The company spent millions on the plant in anticipation of the reopening, a DFO official explaining to the MP crews and plant workers are local. Those businesses and the processing uh, facilities associated with them are located in uh, in coastal communities in Atlantic Canada and Quebec. So uh, that fleet's uh, revenue and, and, and business activities do indeed go to support coastal communities as well.
The offshore fleet was also blamed for the redfish shutdown in the 90s. The closure was part of a region-wide collapse in groundfish stocks. Redfish in the Gulf is one of the few that has fully rebounded. Don't you think that we should look very carefully at that and not allow those big boats coming in the Gulf of San Juan so, so we don't have another decline of these fisheries for years to come? DFO says the quota and management measures will ensure conservation of the stock. Four days of consultations on that with industry and stakeholders will be held in Halifax next week. Paul Withers, CBC News, Halifax. Halifax Transit is adding new bus routes and cutting others to improve service. The department's $68 million budget came before council today. There is a new route to Dalhousie University with three branches and an express to Hemlock Ravine. The future Port Wallace development in Dartmouth will see new buses. And Larry Utex's busy Route 90 would get more rush hour service. There are a lot of positive changes with this. The proposed changes to the 1 and 10 are long overdue. They're going to make a great difference. And the fact that we are seeing increased service on the 90 is fantastic. Beyond that, we're a little concerned just about kind of there's a lot of pro underlying problems that have been happening for months, if not years now, that we're not really seeing addressed by this budget. Staff say the changes give them a pool of 10,000 bus hours to respond to late trips or overcrowding. They also asked to increase fares by 25 cents in September, but councillors asked staff to take a look at other options. The final budget will be passed in April. More than a dozen Atlantic Canadian senators have signed a letter urging the federal government to rename the link between New Brunswick and PEI. The letter says that in the interest of reconciliation, it's time to change the name from the Confederation Bridge to Abiquid Crossing. It's been sent to the Prime Minister and other federal ministers. PEI's legislature voted in 2022 to recommend the name change, but nothing has happened since then. Leading the effort is PEI Senator Brian Francis. This is a win-win for everyone. Uh, it doesn't appear that it's going to be costly. Uh, we're in the true spirit of uh, reconciliation in Canada now. This would be a sign of uh, deep respect for our Mi'kmaq people on PEI who have been here since time immemorial to uh, have the bridge uh, named Everett Crossing. So just writing something, in my opinion, that should have been done in 1996. Uh, the committee suggested the name. The chair was former Premier Alex Campbell. And the government of the day overrode that and named it Confederation Bridge. Charlton MP Sean Casey says he supports Senator Francis. He says he plans to speak with him soon about how he can help move the name change along. But the decision ultimately rests with Public Services and Procurement Canada. Federal funding has been a lifeline for many performing artists trying to share unique Canadian stories. But as Kayla Hounsel tells us, some of that money is set to expire, leaving art and livelihoods on the line, including here in Nova Scotia. Lydia Zimmer lives to dance, but at the moment, she's got more than the music on her mind. The consequences of not having the funding would be that Someone local like myself who doesn't have the biggest resume in the world um, wouldn't, get, wouldn't get programmed. The Canadian Arts Presentation Fund provides financial assistance to organizations that present and support arts programs. Without it, Zimmer says this show, which she choreographed and performed in, would never have happened. I hired dancers, um, I hired lighting designers, costume designers, rehearsal directors, the whole, the whole jumble. The fund got an $8 million top-up in 2019. That extra cash will expire at the end of March. Some say it could mean higher ticket prices and less Canadian content. Those truly Canadian stories that give us a sense of what is happening in various parts of the country, in various cultures. He says 600 organizations stand to lose money, particularly in rural Canada. The costs of touring a show uh, are significant no matter where, you, where you're located. Uh, but of course, the longer the trip, uh, the more expensive it is. 
This summer concert series in Kensington PEI benefits from the fund. The Department of Heritage says the additional money was always meant to be limited and was extended through the pandemic. But under the Spire's executive director says it makes no sense to return to pre-pandemic funding. It's just a different world now. There's different concerns, there's different expenses, there's a lot of different uh, costs that have risen dramatically. <laughs> Zimmer says if the funding is not restored, organizations will be making some difficult decisions about who gets to perform. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. And our first quick break is coming up. Stay with us. Yes, we have a lot more to come on CBC Nova Scotia News. Rapidly growing wildfires in Texas are threatening towns and forcing widespread evacuations. Former Shoppers Drug Mart employees say the company pressures staff to bill for services that patients don't necessarily need. And we've got Ryan up next with the weather forecast. We'll see you in a bit. All right, yeah, there's going to be a quick drop in the temperatures mm. here. we got to get ready for that. I know. Maybe make some ice, ice sculptures or something. <laughs> <laughs> if there's any snow left. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. So 
obviously we had a, a flash freeze on Saturday, a mm -hmm. rapid drop in temperatures, and a lot of folks uh, maybe underwhelmed by that one uh, <laughs> because it is tough to, to say, you know, where there's still going to be standing water when mm -hmm. the temperatures freeze, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whether there's a puddle on your road or not, or your sidewalk or your walkway, uh, I will say this, that um, while that is still difficult to tell as we look into tomorrow, the temperatures are going to drop more rapidly tomorrow than they will uh, than they did on Saturday. And here's the proof from the pudding on that. So this is the Halifax airport. Uh, the lighter peach colored line on the top, that's the temperature drop on Saturday. Eight degrees at the top of that line, all the way down to about minus four by 8 p.m. Uh, the orange line on the bottom, that is tomorrow's forecast. And you can see that that drop, that line drops very much more fast, uh, much more quickly uh, throughout the morning into the early afternoon. And so that's why there will be less opportunity for water to get away, mm -hmm. for it to evaporate, for things to kind of dry up as the rain will quickly taper off and then we freeze up pretty quickly. So uh, just be mindful that that rapid or flash freeze will be uh, likely problematic. And in fact, you can see Edmonston in the northwest under a flash freeze warning right now. We're under rainfall and wind warnings. But look at the huge chunk of the country in purple there that is under a flash mm. freeze warning. Mm. Wow. All of northeastern Ontario, much of Quebec, Labrador, and yes, in the northwestern parts of uh, New Brunswick. So uh, we'll see if that uh, warning is expanded for us. My thinking is it will be. You can see temperatures really dropping dramatically on the other side of that front. <laughs> Toronto was at 15 degrees at lunchtime today. It is now minus two. So that gives you a sense of how dramatic the cold front is and how powerful it is to really drop those temperatures. Sudbury at minus 16, but Ottawa is still at seven. 13 in Montreal. But again, uh, these temps are going to be really dropping in a hurry. Now, it's all thanks to this cold front, which is, of course, uh, ushering the winds in from the west and northwest on the other side of the front, mixing things to some flurries. It's the rain that we're concerned about tonight ahead of the system and the wind. And the wind, as we mentioned earlier, but we'll show you one more time because we went through it pretty quickly. The, the winds really crank up through this evening and then those strongest gusts kind of through the late evening, early overnight hours in through the southwest. That's our best chance of those gusts 80 to 90. That pushes into Halifax in the 2 to 5, 6 a.m. time frame. This will be our greatest risk, risk for power outages in the metro area here. And then eastern areas through tomorrow morning and into Cape Breton. That'll be your best uh, chance of seeing some outages there. The winds will shift to west northwest and again they're going to be quite breezy ushering in that colder air. Now in terms of that timeline again we can see those periods of rain at times heavy in the yellows and oranges here and those temperatures very mild 10 degrees and then we're talking about a 10 8 to 10 degree temperature drop in about three to four five hours with this frontal boundary coming through and so not much chance as we said for the water to get away as we can see those temperatures uh, really falling off here by late morning in the west halifax through the midday time period cape breton uh, you folks will see those temperatures tumbling throughout the afternoon and we're all looking very chilly and by the way these uh, these are just the temperatures the wind chills tomorrow afternoon as you head home will be more like the minus 10 to minus 15 range so it is going to be very cold. And again, uh, that's just a one snapshot of a very uh, variable day in terms of the forecast for tomorrow with the winds shifting to northwest, as we just mentioned. Now, Friday, onshore flurries, even some snow squalls for Inverness, possibly for Anaganesh in, Victor uh, in Pictou County as well, uh, with mainly just a chance of flurries, though. And then we are looking at things kind of quietening down into Friday afternoon. Friday is going to be very chilly, minus four to minus eight for most a little milder here and through the south and west but as we advertised uh, the good news is that that's not going to last long as we can see that area of high pressure moving off southerly winds returning we'll see increasing clouds on saturday but saturday looks like a beauty temperatures mid maybe even some high single digits better chance uh, of showers moving in certainly sunday and into monday but uh, those temps staying quite mild and we should be around one this time of year so punching well above our weight as we move through the first week of march tom and amy that's a varied forecast isn't it <laughs> it certainly is <laughs> okay thanks so much ryan thank you thanks ryan
And up next, I'll talk with the Minister of Environment and Climate Change about how he plans to protect Nova Scotia's coastline now that his government has killed the Coastal Protection Act. That's our Newsmaker interview. Please stay with us. You're watching CBC Nova Scotia News. The Houston government has scrapped the Coastal Protection Act, which was supposed to set the rules for development along our coast. Instead, it is offering a 15-point action plan, including the use of online mapping tools that splits the responsibilities for development among property owners, municipalities, and the province. Environment Minister Tim Hallman is with us from the provincial legislature. Sir, yesterday the Ecology Action Center called your government's uh, turning away from the uh, Coastal Protection Act a, quote, failure of leadership. What do you say to that? Well, I disagree with that. Uh, we're moving forward with coastal protection through our coastal action plan. Um, along with a, a number of other climate policy measures we've put in place, uh, over the last two and a half years that we've uh, had the privilege of, of serving as government. Um, the first piece of legislation we brought in was the Environmental Goals and Climate Change Reduction Act. We then brought in a climate risk assessment which outlines the, the, the hazards due to climate change. And of course we brought in a climate plan, our first climate plan since 2009. 
Um, now, the Coastal Action Plan, which I announced on Monday, uh, is framed up in all those climate policies. Uh, so, as a province, we continue to move forward um, with a climate action plan, an action plan that supports informed decision making of property owners, uh, an action plan that supports municipal and provincial leadership, uh, along with uh, uh, deploying uh, immediate resources for coastal action. The, the argument goes that uh, you know a lot of those tools, um, and we're talking about some of the maps and and some of the data that's that's uh, available, all, has it existed for some time, and and yet questionable in many cases risky coastal development is happening in this province, and the argument is that a more prescriptive approach is what's needed. So the province saying what you can and cannot do, clearly saying it, with the coastline is what would really help the coast the most. Well, the role of government uh, I here is, is collective action, and when I say that, it, it requires the actions of the provincial government, the municipal governments, the federal, and of course our private landowners when it comes to, uh, to coastal action. And uh, we believe the greatest way uh, to protect the coast is through uh, this, uh, this approach of, uh, of informing uh, uh, private landowners uh, who live along the coast to make the best decision about their their property and that's why that's why we've uh, we've put an online interactive map that can be utilized uh, so that you can make the most informed decision about the hazards that may be impacting your property uh, and, a, and a navigator that will help you interpret that information so you can make the most informed decision um, we need the municipalities to work with us on this uh, I've had the privilege of traveling this province the uh, almost three years being a minister and I've seen the incredible work municipalities are doing on climate action so we'll continue to engage and partner with our municipal mm -hmm. units uh, to uh, to uh, to implement this coastal action sure. plan well, I mean I suppose to some of those municipalities as well and they have been looking to the provincial government they were waiting for the coastal protection act uh, they wanted your help to, to to help regulate the coastline now the responsibility is being bumped down to the individuals and the municipalities as you say to make the call about what coastal development should or should not go ahead and the concern is that that's going to end up with a piecemeal approach around the province because every municipality may do something different so Coastal, coastal action, climate action is a shared responsibility and um, you know, we believe in partnering with the municipalities uh, to cooperate with the municipalities because we know they, they know their local communities best. Nova Scotia has 13,000 kilometres of diverse coastline so that what may be effective for coastal protection say in southwest Nova Scotia in, community, in a community like Clare uh, may not be the same in Inverness or Victoria County so it's, it's working with our municipal units um, we'll be working with them to draft an example bylaw uh, and our Department of Municipal Affairs Minister Lohr uh, will be doing that engagement and I'll be doing that engagement uh, as well and, and already you know, my team at Environment and Climate Change, we've, we've had good engagements with uh, uh, Carolyn bolivar Getson. Uh, I spoke to CBRM Mayor uh, Amanda McDougall yesterday. And uh, so the action plan is being put into, into place now, and you're seeing that engagement and that discussion, which needs what, to happen. And what seems to be puzzling for a lot of people is that there were hundreds of submissions sent to your office, only two of them, all but two of them rather, pressed for you to proclaim the Coastal Protection Act. Clearly people wanted the Coastal Protection Act that the, and the protection that it would provide. How can your government go against those wishes? So there's a diversity of opinion on, uh, on the Coastal Protection Act. Uh, and certainly I heard that diversity of opinion through the consultations. Uh, I've heard the diversity of opinion through MLAs, specifically MLAs who represent coastal areas. Um, the one key consensus though out of all that listening uh, uh, over the years is that Nova Scotians want coastal action. Uh, and therefore uh, what we have now is a comprehensive uh, approach uh, that will empower uh, local decision making at the municipal level that will support um, um, informed decision making by residents and deploy immediately uh, resources to help with coastal protection um, such as enhanced flood line mapping, um, coastal erosion surveys which we'll be doing in a very tangible way uh, the Department of Public Works uh, under our plan will be putting up signage uh, in areas that we know are are known hazards to inform Nova Scotia. And yet, just a short while ago, a matter of a few months or a couple of years ago, your party, all parties, agreed that the Coastal Protection Act was the best way to go to do that. So let me put this to you because it's been out there. 
after all the parties, including yours, did say we should, we should pass this act, in the face of the growing damage from climate change, but when it comes to making the law, your party balked because it relies heavily on the support of rural constituents. And, and I guess some people are wondering, were you afraid that this might cost you political support if you did pass the Coastal Protection Act? No, not at all. When, when that act was passed in 2019, we didn't have the Environmental Goals and Climate Change Reduction Act. We, we didn't have a climate plan. We didn't have a, a risk assessment. We didn't have the Sustainable Communities Challenge Fund. Um, so the Coastal Protection Act was very much in isolation. Uh, as a government, we've decided that we need to frame up coastal action within uh, our bold climate action that we have uh, in legislation, that we have in the climate plan. Um, and, and we have an ambitious, um, we have an ambitious land protection target uh, of 20 percent. And let's not forget as well, currently 13.1 percent of Nova Scotia's coastline uh, is protected through provincial parks, through wilderness areas, through nature reserves. So what we have now is an action plan that will guide us over the next number of years uh, to help Nova Scotians uh, work together to protect our, our coastline and, and to ensure uh, that if you're building, uh, you need to build in an area that is, that is safe and, uh, and, and our job is to make sure we get you the appropriate information. Okay, we'll have to leave it there. Mr. Holland, thank you. Thank you, Tom. All the best. Coming up, the widow of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny vows to keep up his fight for democracy.
Welcome back. Dozens of wildfires in northern Texas have triggered a state of emergency. A massive out of control fire in the state's panhandle region is prompting widespread evacuation orders and causing power outages. It is the second largest fire in the state's history and it is continuing to spread. CNN reporter Lucy Kavanaugh has more from the fire zone. We were able to drive out here to Fritch, Texas, which is one of the cities devastated by the wildfires. Population, just over 2,000 people. It is one of the towns that was evacuated on Tuesday when those fires came roaring through. The smoke that you see is the aftermath. Some portions of the town are still smoking, still on fire. There are crews here trying to get that under control. We are hearing that some residents may soon be able to return to the their undamaged homes, but we were actually over there near that smoke. We met a neighbor who had to evacuate when the flames came. When he returned, the four homes across the street for him completely burned to the ground. Absolutely nothing left. He said it was crazy fast that the homes went down in about 30 minutes. Now, I'm also standing next to a church here that became a refuge for people who had to flee the destruction. Most of the people who were taking refuge and that church had to move to a different area where there's more services available to them. But this is a scene that's playing out in so many of these local rural communities. This is a rural area. There's a lot of ranches, horse, cattle, almost impossible to evacuate uh, those animals. Now, while this fire spread incredibly quickly, fueled by the very fast winds and the really dry conditions, the miracle here, despite the amount of area that is covered, uh, 500,000 acres over that, there is some relief uh, in the days ahead. We could be seeing some snow and rain uh, tomorrow or the next day, but it's unclear if that's going to be enough to stop these fires because those winds could pick up afterwards. That was CNN reporter Lucy Kafanoff reporting from Fritch, Texas. Well, it has been an early start to wildfire season in parts of Canada. It comes after Canada's most destructive wildfire season ever in 2023 that burned close to 19 million hectares. There are at least 53 active wildfires burning in Alberta, though the season normally starts on March 1st. The province has been facing warm and dry conditions and could be in for another grim season. Alberta officials say they're busy bolstering resources and aiming to add 100 firefighters to the front lines. A record 2.2 million hectares burned in Alberta last year. And in neighboring B.C., there were more than 100 fires reported at the start of 2024. They're holdovers from last summer that have not gone dormant over the winter. Shoppers Drug Mart is being accused of taking advantage of an Ontario government program that's meant to help patients with their medication. CBC News spoke with former employees who say upper management pushed staff to make unnecessary calls to patients and then build the province and taxpayers. Angelina King has this report. Toronto pharmacist John Nan says med checks are valuable for patients if done appropriately. But he and other pharmacists we spoke to say in some cases the service is being exploited by Shoppers Drug Mart. I worry that something like this really could set us back as a profession, as a healthcare system. Nan says that's partly why he left Shoppers last year. He says his manager shielded staff from the corporate pressure, but when a new person came in and introduced targets... That was the last straw that broke my back because I would not do it. Medication reviews are done across the country, but it appears the concern over how Shoppers is doing them is striking a chord most in Ontario, where the province allows meds checks to be done over the phone instead of in person as was required before COVID-19. That phone call can bring in up to $75, $37 more than a family doctor bills. A letter obtained exclusively by CBC News sent to shoppers management from a group of Ontario pharmacy owners says the pressure to bill is borderline abusive and is creating safety concerns for the provision of good medical care to patients and customers. I'm wondering what you or shoppers has done to address those concerns. 
So once again, we take those allegations very seriously. We are certainly continuing to follow up and, and review this. Shoppers President Jeff Legier says there are no targets or quotas and management does not pressure staff to bill meds checks. He says the service is having a positive impact. We certainly see meaningful outcomes for patients based on our internal data. Four out of ten times, uh, there's a positive intervention that's happening for a patient. It was really uncomfortable. This former shopper's pharmacy assistant says the pressure to cold call patients to schedule meds checks is partly why they quit. CBC isn't identifying them because they now work for a different Loblaws-owned pharmacy. I didn't feel like I was really serving the community in a helpful manner. I thought it was odd. Mary Fernando says she didn't realize she was even getting a meds check at first when her shopper's pharmacy called and asked a few general questions about her routine medications. That is bothersome to have something that was charged that was unnecessary. Angelina King, CBC News, Toronto. The widow of Russian opposition politician Alexei Navalny delivered an emotional speech today before the European Parliament. She's vowing to keep up his fight for democracy. She said Russian President Vladimir Putin must be held accountable for her husband's death. But as Briar Stewart reports, she's not turning her attention to bury. She's now rather turning her attention to burying Navalny. Alexei Navalny's widow, Yulia Navalnaya, made an emotional appeal to the EU Parliament, saying that Russia's President Vladimir Putin needs to be held responsible for what he's done to Russia, for the war he's waging in Ukraine, and for her husband's death. A public funeral will be held for Navalny on Friday in Moscow at a church. His allies had said they approached many locations, but they were turned down. In some cases, they said there was a no as soon as the person heard the name Navalny. Even getting Navalny's body back from the prison has been an ordeal for his family. We spent a week, a week getting Alexei's body and organizing funeral. Then I choose the cemetery and coffin. The funeral will take place the day after tomorrow. And I'm not sure yet whether it will be peaceful or whether the police will arrest those who have come to say goodbye to my husband. Navalny will be buried in a cemetery shortly after the funeral service. It's not clear what kind of security will be in place, but you can imagine that there will be a heavy police presence. We've seen hundreds of mourners being detained and arrested for, for going to memorials and laying flowers to honor him. Prison officials have said that Navalny died of natural causes after returning from a walk at a penal colony on February 16th. His family, supporters and many Western officials hold the Kremlin directly responsible. One of his allies has said that Navalny was killed because he was going to be part of a possible prisoner swap that would see him along with two U.S. nationals exchanged for a Russian security agent who's in prison for murder in Germany. U.S. and German officials haven't commented on those claims. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Prince Harry is promising to appeal after he lost his legal bid to keep his security protection when in the United Kingdom. After the prince gave up his status as a working member of the royal family and moved to the U.S., his, pub his, his publicly funded security detail rather was ended. Harry took the government to court saying he and his family were endangered when visiting the U.K. because of the hostility directed toward him and his wife. He also said they were constantly hounded by the media. The judge in the case ruled that the prince still received security on a case-by-case -case basis and removing his full detail was justified. And about face today by fast food chain Wendy's. Just yesterday, the company's new CEO announced a plan to introduce so-called surge pricing at some of its U.S. locations next year. It would have seen Wendy's raising menu prices during times of peak demand. But the idea got a more than frosty reception, as we hear from the CBC's Scott Peterson. Seems like there is such a thing as bad publicity. Wendy's is pulling back from the idea of, of the ability to change its prices at its restaurants throughout the day in a statement uh, on Wednesday saying that it would not raise prices uh, when our customers are visiting us most. And this is an idea that came from a brand new CEO, Kirk Tanner, uh, barely in the job for a month, had floated the idea of dynamic pricing or surge pricing at restaurants at a shareholder meeting earlier this month. And the idea was 
to have the ability to change prices and menu items throughout the day depending on the demand for it. For example, charging more during lunchtime and less during off hours. Now, part of the reason for the pullback was the outcry from social media. For example, U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren called the move, quote, price gouging. There was also uh, calls growing loud on social media to boycott Wendy's uh, were being floated around as well. So this was a short-lived idea. It gathered a lot of attention, a lot of bad attention, and now Wendy's is falling on the sword and reversing that decision so there will be no price changes for the foreseeable future uh, at what was once expected to be an experiment by Wendy's. Scott Peterson, CBC News, Toronto. Up and down we go. Mm -hmm. uh, it's wow, it's been like an elevator in the weather. At least the temperatures, <laughs> at least. Yeah. yeah, you've been busy trying to track it all. Well, that's right. And, you know, the beauty thing is, uh, unlike these, you know, the systems that come from the east, the, those retrograding mm. systems, when they come from the west, we can keep a pretty close eye on them. And I've been tracking this cold front all day today. And have a look at this. Uh, first, our viewer picture of the day. We have to get to that um, because you can see uh, Dartmouth. Uh, and many places I saw folks are tapping the trees and mm. yes, that's ah. some sap running there in uh, John Earl's backyard 
And it's a good sign. Yeah. Syrup season is upon <laughs> us. Syrup season is upon us indeed. So this is what I want to show you. So there's the uh, cold front. And again, it is charging through Ontario right now and northern Quebec as well. Val d'Or, which is, uh, of course, in northern Quebec, uh, northwestern Quebec, kind of, you know, straight east of Timmins, so to speak. Uh, a temperature drop of 17 degrees in one hour. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's plummeting, isn't it? It's pretty rapid. <laughs> it is. So that is just a sign. Again, Toronto uh, dropped 15 degrees in, uh, in uh, or sorry, 10 degrees in three hours today. Not quite as dramatic, but uh, certainly across the north, it will be more dramatic. Uh, but dramatic for us as well, as you can see, uh, there's the timing again for tomorrow morning. Dropping Digby, Yarmouth, Shelburne, you folks early in the morning. Uh, as well as western areas of the valley. And then for the eastern valley, the Lunenburg area, Halifax, Truro, Colchester, Cumberland, uh, looks like kind of a late morning, early afternoon. And Anaganish, Guysboro, uh, Picto into, uh, into Cape Breton, looks like it'll be kind of a uh, early to mid-afternoon. Cape Breton, perhaps a little bit later than that. Uh, but uh, we will all tumble pretty quickly. And again, Friday, we still stay chilly. But we'll quickly show you that seven day because, as we said, the elevator goes back up. <laughs> it sure does. All right, thanks, Ryan. Thanks, well, Ryan. Well, finally this evening, here's an image that might have you reaching for an air sickness bag. Yes, a plane tried and failed to land in heavy crosswinds at Heathrow Airport in London on Monday. Yeah, the plane appeared unsteady as it approached the runway. It then touched oh down briefly before taking off again. Mm -hmm. Jet managed to, to safe landing on its second attempt. No injuries were reported, but uh, no doubt uh, some passengers uh, disembarked the plane looking uh, green around the gills. I, can only uh, I would imagine. be one of them, I think. I'm not sure of that. That's it for us tonight. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Good night. Good night.